And from record snow in Buffalo to ice in Texas to a parade of atmospheric rivers right here in California. We know well about those. Just about everyone in America can agree it's been a weird winter. Good evening. I'm Amanda Storantino. And I'm Ryan Yamamoto. Our mild President's Day weekend is quickly giving way to some wild winds and a sharp drop in temperatures, the latest in what's being pretty erratic winter. Absolutely, I, Ryan. Say, yeah. That's a good way to put it. And it's because winter overall is actually getting warmer. David Sector is about to show us how winter whiplash impacts all of us on the dot. I can't believe I'm doing this. These people go in the lake every day and stay there for like sometimes 10 or 20 or 30 minutes. This is not something that normal people should be doing. These folks have found a way to embrace the extremes of winter. And this morning, I'm not the only first timer out here. Ever thought you'd swim in hat and the mittens? So is Dr. Heidi Roop, a climatologist at the University of Minnesota. You can do anything for 30 seconds, right? <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Deep breath, yes, deep yes, breath. Yes. Are you guys nuts? Yeah. Holy <laughs> oh. It might not always feel like it, especially when you're chest deep in a frozen lake, but winter is getting warmer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Heidi, how you doing? Great. You how are your toes? Yeah, my I'm toes, do I have toes? <laughs> My name is David Schechter, and this is On The Dot, a journey to understand how we're changing the Earth and how the Earth is changing us. That guy in the zebra jacket? That's Dr. Andrew Schwartz. Man, you know how to make an entrance. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> That's awesome. He's an atmospheric scientist with the University of California, Berkeley, and he runs the Central Sierra Snow Lab. Seven feet roughly, 190 centimeters. So evidently we were digging a pit of snow, and then we're gonna go in the pit and we're gonna talk about the snow. Do I have that right? You do have that right. Okay. Together we're digging a snow pit so he can look back at this season's snowstorms. This is actually, I'm pretty sure they're gonna bury me when it's all done. Dig in your own grave, man. Yeah. Snow is obviously critical to outdoor recreation, but there's an even bigger concern here. So let's talk about snowpack. That's water stored as snow in the mountains. Traditionally, it melts in spring and summer, and that's how California gets 30% of its water. If the snowpack melts too early, you can get floods, and by summer, there's not enough water when water is crucial. What are you doing right now? So the purpose of this whole pit is to give us a story about the snowpack. It has the different layers from different storms. We can see a little bit of ice there. 125, ooh, that's just, she's a warm one. So we get measurements of the temperature of the snowpack to figure out, you know, is it ripe for melt? Is it still pretty cold? These layers of snow can have different temperatures depending on how warm it was the day it fell. The higher the temperature in the snow, the faster it will melt. A major concern in the era of climate change. Once that goes above freezing, that's when we can no longer have the snowpack and this is all gonna disappear and switch to What's that temperature doing over time? It's climbing. We expect a transition away from snowpack and terrain within the next several decades. He knows that because the Snow Lab maintains the oldest continuous winter weather records in the country. For the month of January, for example, the minimum daily temperature at the lab goes up and down over the years, but the 50-year temperature trend is rising relentlessly towards 32 degrees, the line between rain and snow. What does the warming winter mean to the snowpack? The snowpack is less reliable and more variable uh, than it used to be. And if we're switching back and forth between, you know, snowfall and super warm days and snowfall and super warm days, we might not have the chance to really build an efficient snowpack to run off to the agriculture and farmers that need it. Three, two, one, go! There's nothing like an early morning ski race in Minnesota. 
This is a community that puts on big events to embrace winter culture. The strength of our collective and individual action. And they're striking up public conversations about how to lead on climate change. Like much of the country, Minnesota has had a weird winter. There's been a ton of snow. Who wants it? Who wants it? But when it comes to skating, some lakes took six weeks longer than normal to freeze. That's a goal. Scientists are reluctant to blame any one event on climate change, but Dr. Roop is saying they do see the larger pattern. We're confident saying that what we are experiencing as a whole in aggregate is what we expect from climate change and that volatility, um, that sort of unpredictability, that, that weirdness, if you will, um, is, is climate change. Nationally, since 1970, winter has warmed in the Pacific Northwest by one degree. From Southern California through the middle of the country, it's around two degrees warmer. But parts of the Midwest and East Coast have warmed up to five degrees with extreme warming in parts of New York, Vermont, and Northern Minnesota of about seven degrees. We see again these, these patterns of, of concerning um, warming and that is changing what winter looks like, what it feels like, and that has then again implications for what we experience. Concern about climate change led Minnesota to pass a new law. It requires all electricity come from renewable sources by 2040. Can this community actually be part of preserving winter? It seems like a pretty big daunting challenge for one community to do. We as one community are not going to be able to change the trajectory of global average temperature. So if all communities or many communities come together and catalyze change, then the answer is yes. So the change in winter doesn't just affect communities where it's always cold or always snowy. Lots of places are dealing with these changes. I'm Paul. David, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So I'm drinking wine during the day, like you do, with Paul Bush. His family has owned the Madronia Vineyards in Camino, California for over 50 years. And if I were really nice to you, we would be having some blue cheese here and everything. Why aren't you being nice to me? <laughs> <laughs> Paul's telling me consistently chilly winter temperatures are critical to maintaining healthy grapevines. They need to go dormant. They need to lose all their leaves and basically store up energy to push buds for the next year. The earlier you bud, the greater chance you're going to have a problem. And last year, Paul had a problem he'd never seen before. In February, it got unseasonably warm. As a result, the vines started to bud. Then came a frost that killed the buds. In March, it got warm again, more buds, another frost. And in April, it happened for a third time. Our harvest on the vineyards here, we lost about 70%. That's hard on a small family business. In addition to grapes, fruit crops across the country, like apples, blueberries, and peaches, also rely on chilly winters. That didn't happen in 2017 in Georgia and South Carolina, where fruit farmers sustained $1.2 billion in crop losses. There's the bud. Okay. That's next year's crop right there. And so this one will come out here. Take that out close to the trunk. To adapt to the wild swings in winter weather, Paul's experimenting with a new technique delaying when he prunes certain varieties. Pruning it later, it delays the bud break. So you're protecting your, yourself against losing those really precious buds. Yep, but I think that's where all, all vineyards, all farmers are learning to adapt to what we can do. And there are certain things we can do and certain things we can't. I mean, you've got to embrace the season around you, right? You don't have to love winter to understand it's something to be celebrated and protected. But that doesn't mean I'm staying in this frozen lake one minute longer. Awesome. Are you supposed to be able to feel your legs? No, no. Okay, because I don't feel my legs. So refreshing. You know what? I feel pretty great right now. I'm David Schechter, on the dot, and I'd love to hear from you. So what's the future of winter look like here in the Bay Area? Temperatures are getting warmer, so you can see them go up and down over the last 50 years right here on this graph that you see on your screen. But overall, winter in San Francisco is now 3.3 degrees warmer on average. And experts say 
that trend will continue.